We're powerless when we feel we have no available resources to live a life of love. We push people away when, they think, when we think that they're trying to take the last little bit of something that we have. Christians must live lives of great love because they have untold resources. Running out of gas. Running out of batteries. Running out of electricity. Running out of water. It doesn't matter which one. You can probably think of a time uh, when you ran out of one of those things or all of those things, uh, right? Your car uh, won't run. You run out of one of these resources. Your lights go out. Something is overheating. You run out of one of these resources. The next thing you run out of is power because running out of resources leaves you powerless, Now, when was the last time you found yourself running out of spiritual resources? Running out of patience. Running out of compassion. Running out of willpower. Maybe you found yourself powerless to love because you felt you ran out of love's resources. Right? The problem is this. We're powerless when we feel we have no available resources to live a life of love. We're powerless when we feel we have no available resources to live a life of love. Just like we fear that natural resources may run out, we often fear that our spiritual resources will run out. So Paul has spent the first seven chapters of the book of Romans laying out life's problems. How we fail to get along with our neighbor, fail to get along with God, and how we find ourselves in a battle every time we try and do good. And that's why Paul has to make this crescendo in Romans chapter 8. He has to reassure his readers that their spiritual resources will never run out. Otherwise, how would they live? How do you live when you feel like you have a resource that's about to run out? You're stingy with it, right? Like I am, <laughs> right? I feel like I don't have enough water. I, uh, I don't give it freely. Uh, maybe it's some other kind of resource, and I, uh, what, do I, what do I tend to do? I hoard it. Why? Because I'm afraid of losing it. The world gets colder and colder if we treat love that way. We push people away when, they think, when we think that they're trying to take the last little bit of something that we have. But the big idea in this passage is that Christians must live lives of great love because they have untold resources. Christians must live lives of great love because they have untold resources. And we're going to get an understanding of what those untold resources are when we look at four things in this passage. Here are the four things, right? Uh, The personality of the Spirit, the power of the resurrection, two kinds of debt, Two kinds of people. All right, you ready? Let's go. Starting with the personality of the Spirit in verses 9 and 10. It's important here at the outset of this passage to talk about the Holy Spirit as a person of the Godhead. Too often, Christians refer to the Holy Spirit as something like a force emanating from God the Father or God the Son. Sometimes uh, folks even mistakenly uh, refer to the Spirit as it rather than he. You're a person. How would you like it if I called you it rather than he or her? Don't do that. (laughs) How does someone know who God is? I'm fond of saying, uh, hey, God will not fit under your microscope. So the only way that you can come to know him is if he reveals himself to you. And Christians believe that God has chosen to reveal himself to people through the scripture. So the way that the Bible describes the Holy Spirit is also the way that Christians must describe the Holy Spirit. So now, of course, there's a good deal of mystery around this, but you also have to put things together that are clearly there in Scripture, things that Christians have held since the very beginning. So here in verse 9, it says that you are not of the flesh if the Spirit of God dwells in you. That's a positive statement. But there's also a negative statement right after it. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Now pay attention, because the terms spirit of God and spirit of Christ are used interchangeably. 
So now, Christ is a person, not a force or an emanation. So since these terms are used interchangeably, it's right for us to understand the Spirit as a person as well. So then Paul goes on in verse 10 with two contrasts. On the one hand, he contrasts death and life, and on the other hand, he contrasts sin and righteousness. But he holds together interchangeably again Christ and the Spirit. It says, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And then he goes on again in verse 11 saying twice that the spirit dwells in you. So you must see in this passage and in others throughout the Bible how the spirit is a person, not a force or a strange emanation. You can only actually make sense of this passage if you know that Christ is a person who dwells in you. And when it says also that the Spirit dwells in you, he must be a person too. It is not Jesus and his force dwelling in us. <clears throat> now similarly, in verse 16, it says the Spirit bears witness with our spirit. Friends, an impersonal force cannot bear witness Right? You cannot uh, subpoena gravity and put gra call gravity to testify on the witness stand. If you're going to call someone to a witness stand, you have to call someone. You have to call a person in order that for them to testify, to bear some kind of witness. The personhood of the Holy Spirit is a really important Christian doctrine, and I'll tell you why. If you're looking for resources to live a meaningful life, if you want to live a life of love and purpose, you need a person dwelling in you, not a force. Because when you think of love, meaning, purpose, you think of it personally. A person works with you. A force works in spite of you. Right? You can, you can uh, miss the road sign and go uh, floor the gas pedal in your car and go right off a cliff. Gravity doesn't care. It's an impersonal force and you will fall at 9.8 meters per second squared. But when it comes to looking for resources to live a life of love, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is a powerful person who works with you so that you can live that life. Now, what kind of power are we talking about? Well, in verse 11, it's the power of the resurrection. So let's look at that. It says there that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. Now, uh, those of you who have studied physics, uh, you can tell us that power is known as the capacity to do work. And power can be measured in watts, it can be measured in horsepower and other similar units. And the four strongest forces on Earth uh, are gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. Uh, and I was looking this up, just thinking about power, and I found this out. A one megaton nuclear bomb has the power of one million tons of TNT. Now, that is a powerful force. Uh, uh, did you know that the United States, we have, we have a 1.2 megaton bomb in our arsenal. It's called the, uh, the B-83, and it is 60 times more powerful than the nuclear bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan in 1945. What can this power create? Death and destruction. Human ingenuity has harnessed one of the four most powerful forces in the world, and the thing it produces is death. Now, some of you will remind me, nuclear energy can also produce electricity, and that's true. Um, but it is a contentious subject. Why? Because of the destructive power that's also part of the conversation. Now, to be clear, don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not trying to tell you to think one way or another about nuclear energy. But what I am trying to do is point out that the most powerful force that humans have tried to harness cannot match the power of the Holy Spirit. Because name a power on earth that can bring a man back from the dead. 
And I'm not talking about, you know, those, uh, those AED paddles that when someone's heart stops beating, you zap them and the heart stops, starts beating again. What I'm talking about is a man who hung on a cross and was brutally uh, killed over the course of six hours on history's blackest Friday. He was taken down and laid in a tomb, and the tomb was guarded by the SEAL Team 6 of Rome's elite army, and he was left there for three days. What brought that man out of the tomb? What brought that man back to life? The power. Paul says it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does what nuclear energy cannot do. And Paul says that that energy... That power is at work in Christians, people who've placed their faith in Christ. So now Christians have the Holy Spirit, who is a powerful, personal being dwelling in them. And notice one more time the Trinitarian language used here in verse 11. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, will give life to your mortal body through that same Holy Spirit who is dwelling in you. Paul says the same thing in another one of his letters to the church. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, Paul says uh, that he wants Christians to know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. That power is better than a renewable resource. That power is unique. It is the power to love. It comes from God, the one who created you and the one who saves you by the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's not a question of whether this power is power enough. The real question is, why do Christians uh, so often only dabble in this power to love? But we spend so much of our time and energy looking for and trying to acquire worldly power, social capital, political power, willpower, psychological power. These all pale in comparison to the power of God at work through the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's power not only to love your loved ones, But more than that, it's power to love even your enemies. Uh, I can think of no better example of this than a man named John Perkins, uh, who uh, was an African-American man, lived in Mississippi uh, during uh, the 1950s and 60s, and uh, was arrested and beaten for trying to help people register to vote. He's written about it in a book called Let Justice Roll Down. And he tells the story in the book of being taken to a jail and being beaten by uh, a, a white sheriff and a number of white sheriff's deputies. And he describes the horror of the pain. He describes himself as a, as a bloody mess. And he describes the power of the Holy Spirit at work in him that in that lowest place, in that jail, looking at that white sheriff, calling him all kinds of names and doing horrible things to him, He had the indwelling power in his heart and mind to offer him forgiveness and to feel for him love. A power not only to love your loved ones, but a power to love your enemies. This power turns Christians into debtors. I know what some of you are thinking. "Ah, I knew there was a catch. Right? There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Oh, I get this power, but I have to pay, uh, I have to pay something for it. i got to pay it back. But you need to remember that there are two ways to be in debt. And Paul is referencing both of them here. Uh, the first kind of debt that Paul talks about is in verse 12 when he describes being a debtor to the flesh. And that's like the kind of debt that we uh, most often think of, debt that we're trying to pay back. Uh, The kind of debt when I say, oh, I'm in debt, I'm thinking of this. I think if I spend money on credit, I go into debt. I have to pay that money back to the credit card company or pay money back to the bank. Um, And in some cases, you have to pay that money back, what? With interest. Being a debtor to the flesh is like that. 
You're always borrowing more and trying to pay it back, but the interest keeps you in debt. And uh, you know, the most obvious example of this is something like addiction. Whenever someone finds themselves addicted, whatever it is that you're addicted to is something that you, uh, you're borrowing on. You're borrowing that addictive sub- substance in order to feel a certain way. Your addiction makes you feel powerful or it makes you feel popular or it makes you forget for a little while that you're not powerful or popular so you don't care. But you always end up paying for it later when it comes to addiction, right? Uh, Alcohol addiction is the easiest example to point out. But uh, now that I'm celebrating my fourth Sunday in a row in Roseville, uh, right? Previously, I've only ever been here three Sundays in a row. Now that I'm here, uh, starting to get to know us and getting to know our community a little more, I think there's another way of, uh, another debt to the flesh that we might struggle with. Achievement. Achievement is another way to be in debt to the flesh, and it works similarly to alcohol or credit card debt. Achievement always gives you a a short-term payoff, the high of uh, getting the promotion or the pay raise. But then what happens? You immediately start working for the next one, get to the next rung on the ladder. You get the grade, and once you've got it, instead of being content, you're working hard. You need the next one. You need the next hit. You brand yourself with the lifestyle that you think you want, but it just makes you jealous for the person who has just a little more of that lifestyle than they've achieved just a little more than you. And so you want to achieve just a little more. You keep trying to pay achievement with more achievement, and that can make you a debtor to the flesh. And verse 13 says this kind of debt ultimately kills you. Now, there's a second kind of debt. Right? What if you gave me a thousand dollars and you told me to give it to her? I would be in your debt. Not to pay you back, I would be in your debt to give the money to her. That's another way. And that's what Paul is saying that Christians are in debt. This is the this is that second kind of debt. In verse 12, Paul says Christians are debtors. He means this. You've got a powerful person indwelling you. He is at work in you giving you untold resources. He's working with you so that the power that brought Jesus back from the dead is at work in you and you have a debt to use that power for the good of others. And friends, that kind of debt is actually life-giving. Wouldn't you love, how would you feel to be given $1,000 with the job of giving it to someone you know who needs it? Knowing that the whole time your own needs are also being met. It's a life-giving kind of debt. If you have those resources, you can love your loved ones and you can even love your enemies. Now, these two kinds of debt produce two kinds of people in verses 14 through 17. Paul says that the first kind of debt produces slaves, but the second kind of debt produces sons. And this is the part of the passage where the music really starts to get loud again, because slaves can't pay back. In fact, slaves are always getting deeper and deeper into the debt, but sons... And don't be offended, ladies. The reason he's talking about it, sons and not sons and daughters, he means sons and daughters. He's implying that with it. Uh, But it has to do with inheritance, how inheritance worked in the ancient world, that it came to sons. Sons have all their needs met and more. Verse 15, you did not receive a spirit of slavery, but you received a spirit of, literally in one word, sonship or as it says in our uh, translation, adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. I had a friend who, uh, you know, whenever I think of Abba, Father, I think of a friend of mine who cried out to his father. It was because he was 16 and he had wrecked his car. Now, he lived in the nice part of town where I'm from, 
And uh, we were all so jealous of this amazing brand new car that our 16-year-old friend had gotten. And the day after he got it, he took a corner too fast and wrecked it and totaled the car. And do you know, the next day, he had the same car given to him by his father, pristine and brand new. Now, we can argue about the wisdom of whether or not, uh, you know, the father giving the son the car who's 16 after the day of wrecking, you know, like all of that. But how much more does your good and wise heavenly father give you what you need when you cry out to him? If that's how it works in the world, uh, you know, with an unwise father and son, how much better does it work when you have the spirit of sonship and cry out to your heavenly father who is wise, who is good, who is loving, who knows exactly what you need before you ask for it and gives it to you. As Paul says in Philippians 4.19, my God will meet all your needs out of his glorious riches in Christ. You haven't been given love and grace that runs out. It's there in abundance for you from your heavenly father. And with it, you have power. You have the power to put to death the practices of the body. Paul's using this phrase, deeds of the body, in a negative sense. And uh, this is where we uh, get our $5 theological word for it. We call it mortification. Right? The putting to death of the deeds of the body is the mortification of sin. There's a very famous Puritan named John Owen uh, who's quoted as saying, be killing sin or it will be killing you. You have resources to kill sin. You have resources to live a life of meaning, purpose, and above all else, love. But what if you don't always feel that way? And that's where verses 16 and 17 are so important. He says, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. And in fact, in the original language, Paul uh, literally says, co-witness. The Spirit co-witnesses with us that we are children. And here the music really does start to get louder. Uh, it's as if Paul is saying, and you know what children are, don't you? Don't you? Don't you? Children are heirs. Heirs of the riches of God. And then he uses this weird prefix again. He says, co heirs with Christ. The Spirit co witnesses. We are co heirs with Christ. But you and I both know that life is not this easy. You don't always feel like a son. Life doesn't always sparkle and shine. Christians know we live in a fallen world and that there will be trouble. And we're going to talk more about that next week. Paul is playing the music louder, but I promise you he's not naive because he adds this phrase, provided we suffer with him. But again, he uses that, that prefix. He actually says, provided we co-suffer. And then he finishes his play on words, we co-suffer in order that we may be co-glorified. Co-witness. When you don't feel like a son, the indwelling Holy Spirit reminds you that you are co-heirs. The children of God have untold resources, co-suffer. Even in suffering, you have the resources of the Spirit so that you are not alone and destitute and co-glorified. There is an end to suffering, and it is when Jesus is glorified as his return, and we taste it a little bit now, but then we'll have it fully. And now, you, even now, you have resources available to you to love even your enemies. And Augustine helped me understand this. I uh, found a quote by him where he said, that your enemies have been created is God's doing. That they hate you and wish to ruin you is their own doing. What should you say about them in your mind? Lord, be merciful to them. Forgive them their sins. Put the fear of God in them. Change them. You are loving in them not what they are, but what you would have them become. And I think that helps me understand a little bit of what John Perkins was communicating in his story in that jail in Mississippi. A power that never runs out. 
a power to live a life of meaning and purpose. You have resources for love. The personality of the Spirit reminds us that the Spirit is a person, not a force. So there is a powerful person working with us when we face all of life's situations. The power of the resurrection is the power at work in Christians. The power that brought Christ back to life is at work to help you love your loved ones and more than that, to love your enemies. Two kinds of debt. One is a slavery that can never be paid off. But the debt of Christians is one where you have an obligation to give away the untold resources you've been given, to use those resources both for the mortification of sin and for the good of others. And two kinds of people, without the Spirit of Christ dwelling in you, you're a slave. But with the Spirit of Christ in you, you're a son. No matter what you find yourself facing or feeling, You have resources to face even the worst suffering because the Spirit co-witnesses that you're a son, which makes you a co-heir, so you're never alone. But you are co-suffering with Christ, and therefore you must be co-glorified with him. Present and future glory is yours in Christ. Let's pray.